Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to SETI's um, Enchanted Technology Festival. I'm really excited. It's been five weeks and we're almost at the end. This is our um, last programmed sort of speaker. And I'm, I'm very excited to have Alex to talk. Um, speak today and I'm going to introduce Alex in the talk a little more carefully. Um, but it's a it's a perfect talk to end because it's really about um, collaborative um, creation and community and the role that art and technology can play in sort of engagement and also storytelling about the past and the future. Um, and I wanted also to mention that the reason, one of the reasons we had this institute is that we are in the process of launching a few projects as part of um, X archive sort of storytelling about historical cultural um, stories of Portland's um, immigrant communities um, focused on migrations, displacement, culture, and erasure, but also presence and future. Um, we will be having a, to end the Institute and next archive session at the SETI lab at Portland State tomorrow. Join us, it's at 1.30. Um, and we'll be talking about projects where we're going to start about um, murals and the jazz music clubs in the Albina district, and also um, the graves of Chinese immigrant families um, at Block 14 at Lone Fur. So we would love to have your participation join us. Um, as part of the, the institutes, we realize learning happens in different ways. We've had workshops and speakers, and we will have a, a few days of collaborative making from September 8th through 10th of making very simple sort of light sculptures, musical murals, um, animations, um, generative designs, um, enchanted objects of various sorts. You don't have to have, you don't have to have taken the workshops. We're going to do everything. We'll make a, a series of cool little things and we'll have a show on the 17th of that and other projects that people have been working on through the institutes and in the past few months. So um, stay tuned for that. But for now, I want to, I'm so honored and, and delighted to have Alex Chu speak with us. Um, Alex is this incredible sort of local treasure. He's a Chinese American painter and muralist in Portland. Um, he has a background in illustration and comics. And his work is of, um, of public art as a form of storytelling, incorporating community input, collaboration. Um, and he, he really sees this work as a, a form of documentary to accurately document local histories and help communities explore identity through this creative process. Um, it, it fits in perfectly with everything, all of the stories and the workshops, um, and to remind us that, that art um, and making have a powerful role in both storytelling um, and making history and presence with, visible in the world and critically engaging with it through community, through through personal. Um, and so I'm going to let Alex take it away to tell us about um, some community mural creation that, he, that he's been working on recently. We will um, jump in on YouTube and add comments. And those of you who are on the SETI Discord, you're welcome to join a the conversation there too. We will have plenty of time for a discussion at the end. So thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this and I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing. Um, I think using augmented reality as, as part of the creative process and as a part of public art is really um, going to change how things work in terms of uh, interacting with artwork. So I'm, I'm excited and I want to continue collaborating with you if possible. Um, let me set up my screen share. I have a PowerPoint. Um, planned out. I just want to make sure that it works. Um, share. I don't know if I'm okay. So this is. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Let me make sure because I I'm it's covering one of my monitors and I want to see if I can change how that works. Oh, I think that that's been how it's working throughout that you're kind of a little bit driving without seeing, but luckily you have the other monitor. But yeah, it's it it seems to be working. Okay, if you guys can see it, then I'll just continue to to move forward. So um, I've been doing community murals um, for the past five years. So it hasn't been a very long time, but it's become 
um, somewhat of my full-time job. Um, and I think it's different than um, what I would say that every muralist does in their work. I think a lot of muralists, they have a certain artistic discipline that they've created for themselves or have a certain style or type of artwork that they do. Um, mine specifically has to do with um, engaging with the community and, and representing folks in the community. So I feel like there's a, a, a different aspect to it. Like half of the work that I do is actually going into um, the spaces and organizations that I work for and um, learning about their history and stories and trying to engage the people who are uh, currently there. So this, this particular mirror, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, this is a mural that I painted at Prescott Elementary School. And um, um, it was probably one of the, I think maybe the second or third mural that I I did in, in Portland. Uh, and what I did was, um, I, I think what happens is um, my first project was with TriMet. And I, I, I think that um, the themes that I brought up was, well, I guess I'll talk about that later, but um, uh, basically we, I had the um, opportunity to sit down with kids and um, I wanted to engage them in educational subject matter that they'd be interested in. So I brought a lot of different props um, that kind of address different areas of study like science and art and uh, music. And um, I, I gave them the opportunity to pose with different objects and I was able to uh, paint the kids in this mural. And I think that um, what I'm proud of that I'm able to do with my work is personally connect with individuals and in a way um, make it so that um, certain folks can see themselves in the artwork but um, and, and feel a personal attachment um, to to the piece of work. And that's what I've been um, somewhat proud of uh, with how I approach public art. But this is uh, the piece that I've done for um, Prescott Elementary School. Um, I have a lot of different slides, so I'll try to um, keep it quick, but I have six different projects that um, I wanted to talk about. Um, and um, this is kind of the first. So everything's been, my whole journey with um, public artwork and mural artwork has been um, an experiment for me. Um, I feel like it pushed me into a realm of artwork that um, kind of changed how I saw artwork altogether. altogether. Um, before I did murals, I was a cartoonist and um, really it was, it was um, for my own personal escape. So I never thought I was actually gonna be a professional artist in my lifetime. Um, I like to draw cartoons and the stuff that I did was for myself. And I would say that it was really weird. Um, I would categorize what I did as psychedelic cartooning and I would just doodle and the stranger it was, the more it was interesting to me, but it was really a personal form of escape. Um, but I did care about creating um, fun artwork and I invested a lot of my time into it. I did consider myself to be um, a real artist and cartoonist. But as I as I um, tried to make money off of my art and turn it into a professional endeavor, um, I, I had kids and, and, and at a certain point I felt like I couldn't actually like continue to do art um, unless I was getting paid for it. Um, but I, I at a certain point I was doing kids illustra uh, kids books with um, kids illustrations and it, it was pushing my boundaries as to like what I was doing with my art and um, I had done murals in the past um, it was more cartoon in orientation like strange cartoons um, but um, I was I, I applied for the rack mural roster and um, I think I was given the opportunity to apply for a mural for TriMet. So at the time they were working on the blue line and there was three particular murals that were um, going to be created. And one of them included the Hollywood Mac stop where there was a, a stabbing that occurred over there. Um, but um, I we were working on this uh, uh, ideas for this blue line mural. And um, at the time I was processing a lot because I had just become, well, I, I, I was a stand. 
uh, excuse me if i if i have um if i start coughing i actually tested positive for covid so if i'm coughing uh please excuse me i'm just um trying to get through that but i i think i'll be fine it's not it hasn't been too bad but um during the time that i i planned to to propose artwork for this mural i was a stay-at-home dad and i had a two-year-old um and um i i was also it was also during the time when the when there it was like the election year 2016 that we started applying for this and i think that the politics especially racial politics were getting really intense or at least became uh present in the forefront of um culture and society i think people were having more discussions and trying to understand that because I think that there was a lot being instigated by um, the elections and, and media um, about race. And um, it was something that I was trying to address. Um, I, I felt very like I was going through a lot of difficulty processing some of those issues. And I think the way that I wanted to deal with it is use um, use my opportunity to do public art to um, promote some positive images about communities of color. And, um, and the idea that I came up with, um, my daughter is actually um, featured in this mural. Um, she's in the panda shirt. Um, and what I, how I approached it is um, I, I chose to feature folks in the community, and it's not necessarily all communities of color, but I, I did want to focus on communities of color, but focus on some of the organizations and individuals who are making a positive change in the community, uh, especially in the East Portland area. Um, that's what um, that's what I wanted to focus on, on this mural. So um, part of this was um, when I was coming up with the creative process, I was um, taking my my kid out to different areas, but uh, of Portland in in terms of her everyday interactions. But also, um, I wanted to have my daughter interact with some of the organizations that were in the neighborhood and highlight how different co communities of color, leaders of color, um, helped to raise my family or were a part of um, my parenting process. So that's um, the concept behind the mural. So we used to take um, Mazzy out to um, song and uh, like uh, different kids performance groups. So we went to an Olive and Dingo show at Hammer and Jack's, uh, which is um, in the Foster, Foster Powell area. And I also, um, we attended meetings um, at the time, Apano, the Asian Pacific Network of Oregon had a youth group called Ally, Asian Leaders for the Liberation of Youth. So I brought her to these different spaces um, in order to get um, photography of um, some of the folks in the community and to highlight some of the works that they were doing. So at the time we were going to Imago Dei Eastside Gathering as our church and Mike Dean was the music director. Um, so we had some pictures of, of um, him playing music uh, and teaching Mazzy how to play music. Um, I, I, I was recommended to, to speak to Carlos Chavez of the Morpheus Youth Project. Carlos works with um, incarcerated youth and, um, and uh, underprivileged youth in order to teach art and hip hop culture um, to young folks. Uh, Kevin Lee was um, teaching breakdancing at the time. So I have that image there. Um, I, I spent some time with Phoenix Johnson, who is a native um, activist and and um, her and her friends um, performed a sage smudge um, with Mazzy there. So I included this image and um, I attended just normal everyday gatherings like picnics. So I had a friend, Letty Lou, who works at a farm, who works in, in, in at a farm and um, we had a picnic with her and her friends. So I just wanted to create an atmosphere that showed, especially in East Portland, I think that there is a lot of diversity there, but I wanted to um, kind of highlight um, the diversity in the area, and but also um, really highlight individuals um, that lived in the area. Um, so 
I had the opportunity to do that. And it was difficult for me to approach that, but um, uh, so this is what the um, part of it was at the top. So there was nine different panels. Um, this was um, from the top. And then the other one you can see from the freeway. And this is probably the most public uh, mural that I've done, um, but it, it was a great opportunity um, to be, and, and it was a life changer. Um, to be able to work on a project like this because it really um, gave me the opportunity to do more murals. And um, I did start to realize the importance of what I was doing. It was different from the other art that I was doing. I didn't focus on myself as much. I was focusing on others in the community and I was um, starting to, to feel the importance of what that meant. And I was able to explore those topics a little bit uh, deeper and and challenge myself in my artwork and, and what that meant for the community. So I, I'll, I'll kind of talk about a little bit of the process that I went through for each. Um, so when I was at these spaces, um, I would take pictures and then I would collage them together in order to create the artwork that would go onto the mural. Um, and, and it did test me to um, learn how to interact with folks in the public, to to ask for permission to to illustrate uh, to put them in public artwork, and um, it really was a different dynamic than what I was used to. Um, I, I think it really pushed me as a as a person to figure out <coughs> how to approach people, and then ask them for permission to paint them, but also. Um, um, I think in the end to create these products, I think people really did feel honored. So this is one of the slides that shows some of the people that were featured. So Kevin Lee's the break dancer, and these are all pictures that were sent to me online and and through um, mess uh, messenger. Uh, people were able to take pictures next to their image and show them to me. And even my my daughter um, went and did a little photo shoot in front of her um, portraits too. So it opened me up to this idea that um, people cared about it and that they felt recognized and um, seen. And, and it, it gave me a certain feeling of responsibility that if there are folks who aren't recognized and aren't seen, but they do a lot in the community, that I wanted to um, be able to feature those folks um, almost as like a, not like a hidden history, but like um, I... I just to be able to give people a window, at least into my world of who I, I think um, have been doing good work. And, and as I started interacting with more community members, I started gaining a better understanding of Portland and Portland's history and who's doing good work in the area. So um, it did become an important part of um, my own personal education and transformation as an artist. Okay, that's just one project um, that really kicked off my work into um, different types of murals. And um, um, this project in particular um, was a really interesting project. I, I was able to use the work of kids to, to be able to create the narrative of this, um, this mural. Um, I think it was 60 feet long altogether, um, and it was a big challenge for me. And with schools in general, the, the there's not a lot of budget, but I, I took this very seriously as a chance to be able to showcase my work and build my portfolio. At the time, I just finished TriMet and maybe Prescott Elementary School, so I didn't have a lot of um, pieces that I've done. This was at Davis Elementary School in Gresham, and... Um, the concept of this was to uh, represent diversity in the neighborhood. So I did realize at this point that I was going to be pigeonholed into an artist that represented diverse culture. And um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what that meant, because I think that someone once told me um, this diversity, uh, um, this EDI um, diversity chair for um, PNCA, uh, Victor Moldonado told me that um, it is a white supremacy tool to create images of fantasy diversity. 
um, and that that is a form of like appeasement, um, and and that it's not always benefiting um, communities of color, and that's been something that I'm still exploring. That is difficult for me. It is a challenge. Maybe if we have some discussions, we can talk about that a little bit. But um, it is something that I've been having to think about. And, but for me, um, how I've been kind of thinking about that is uh, I'm really trying to realize the importance of the story that I'm telling and who I'm depicting. So I don't just paint people for the sake of painting people because they are of a different um, skin color or cultural background. Um, and I really try not to just check off every box off of the list. And also that's very difficult because in my murals and I have to paint like 50 people in order to make something, you know, to completely uh, represent everybody in the community. But what's more important to me is being able to showcase other people's stories and um, showcase the work that they're doing and create a product that um, that is more like a collaboration with my subject so that they feel included in the process. And, and that's how I have been approaching my um, community-based murals in order to make myself feel like they are a product that's important to others and not just myself, or I'm not just falling into the, the client's desires to have a diversity mural. So I've been trying to figure that out. So what I did is I, I created a um, kind of an activity <clears throat> and I asked folks, if, uh, the kids, and and um, to draw pictures based off of the prompt. If if I were to write a book, what would I write a book about? And um, I got a lot of entries. So everybody in the school who was able to fill out this, do this activity, gave me a picture. And I think I had something like three hundred pictures, um, and I had the responsibility of kind of. Uh, uh, choosing the ones that I thought were most interesting and where I would have different subject matter to paint, but also um, kind of uh, highlight people's talents and their own personal artwork. So um, one of them was like, I wanted to write a book about penguins. I wanted to write a book about outer space. I want to write a book about robots and futuristic cars. And I really love these pieces of artwork that the kids were giving to me. And then I, I found the, the students whose artwork that I chose and then created a narrative and gave them props so that they could take pictures that I could use for photo reference that would incorporate their artwork into the sketch. So um, one person wanted to be a ballerina or a ballet dancer. One person wanted to be, uh, well, these are, these are the photos that I did and eventually I created this sketch which incorporated their artwork uh, into the sketch and then also incorporated their photos that I used for photo reference. Um, and I've been using a lot of the digital process for this. Um, it's been great to be able to use um, an iPad to create artwork. Um, I, and I do a lot of my sketches digitally and you can even do quick mock-ups and I'll, I have other sketches that I'll show you, but you're able to do mock-ups onto the wall themselves. And uh, it's been a great tool to be able to have iPads to create these sketches. Um, I was eventually able to grid it out on the wall and create sort of like a coloring book format. Um, and um, this was my first attempt to figure out how to um, allow kids to participate <laughs> in the creation process. So I created this line work like a coloring book and then eventually I got different um, colors to represent um, the colors. And then I'd tell the kids, well, this part's supposed to be dark blue and this part's supposed to be yellow. And I'd hand them um, a cupcake tray full of colors or I'd give them um, cups and they'd be able to help paint in the solid colors. And if they didn't do a perfect job, you know, all I'd have to do is paint over it and, and uh, kind of fix it up a little bit. And that was a lot of the process. But... Um, so with community painting, I don't necessarily feel like it makes the process easier all the time because people are of a different skill level. So part of it is planning it so that people are able to handle it at their own skill level. So if all they can do is just fill in the color, 
Um, that's something that they, anybody can do. Um, but when it comes to refining the painting, um, that's something that either I have to do or you find people with a little bit more skill level to be able to have them do that. So I eventually um, spent a lot of time, I probably spent an extra month on this piece and, and uh, really refined all of the faces and features and added my own um, touches to the artwork to be able to create this um, final mural. So that's the second project that I'm presenting, the, the Davis Elementary School mural. Um, this one over here, um, this was a different process too, and, and the aesthetic's different. Um, I did the interior mural for Apano's 082 building, which is their um, new um, building site since they moved um, into this space. I think that the space has been around for, I would like to say four years or three years. So I completed this right before the pandemic. Um, I wonder if I was painting in it during the pandemic. I don't really even remember, but it was a different process. And the pro <coughs> the process behind this mirror was more of a, um, was more of a, a, a a storytelling and events process. So I would say that in murals, there's there's two things that we're doing. One is creating the content, and then two is actually painting it and 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 putting it on the wall. And there's way, ways of engaging the community in both. But this one was um, an experiment in engaging with the community to get the content in a way that was more of an event. So I, I created these community storytelling events and I wish I had more pictures from the events themselves, but I was busy um, actually interviewing folks and getting, uh, and, and getting their content. But what I had people do is I said, I want you guys to create the imagery or bring me the imagery that I'm gonna put into the murals, um, but I wanna have an event behind it. So I created, um, there was actually three events, but two of them were official events. I, I was trying to work with the youth, but the youth program was in flux. So I created two community events where people came out and I asked them to bring email me some images um, that represented their cultural background or their family background. And then I had them come to describe why they chose those images. So people came together and were able to have this community storytelling event and talk about certain images. And I remember one person who had a, I believe had a Filipino background, brought up this image of a chicken or a rooster. And there was a specific name for that rooster, but this is the image that she brought to show and how this is something that was meaningful to her. And eventually, um, because I got so many um, family photos, I wanted to create something that had the feeling of um, family photos, old family photos. And I actually called this piece um, Legacy. And it's the idea that um, at a certain point, we become the people who pass down our culture to the next generation and how it's important to understand our, our part in that, that we have a legacy that we're trying to pass down to the next generation. So a lot of folks even um, said that one of their regrets is not or one of the difficult parts is that if they didn't have photos of their relatives from the past um, because of moving or because some of it might have gotten destroyed. Um, so I think that there is a value to having old photos and maintaining this history to, to, to think of your history as a, a greater history for the community. So um, I took some of these um, events photos and portraits of people and family photos and then created the artwork out of that. So this is, again, some digital imagery that I made for the sketch. And um, the method that I used was um, I actually projected it directly onto the wall um, and was able to just paint it that way to speed up the process. So, and um, again, um, there was some pride in having folks take pictures of themselves. I don't know if um, you um, folks know Suba, Sub Subanashi, I think is how you pronounce her name, but um, I, I painted her as a, as a South Asian dancer um, on one part of the mural. And my daughter is a constant theme in my murals, but I, I, I'm very proud to be able to create public work to, to um, 
give her, her pride and a sense of belonging in the neighborhood. Um, the image of my daughter was when she was learning to use her chopsticks. And my my feeling of passing down culture to the next generation is teaching small things that I know about, like using chopsticks and trying to um, continue that. Because I was born in Southern California. Um, so um, part of my history is um, trying to hold on to and not lose uh, my Chinese background and um, figure out small ways to hand that down to my kids as well. So this is the 082 mural at Apano, the interior mural. <coughs> this was an opportunity. It is the take flight mural. And this was actually a mural that was used in a music video. And I have, um, I have segments of that video, or at least a preview of that video that I'm going to show to you guys. Um, and, and this mural was interesting because it had happened right in the middle of the pandemic, but also in the middle of the Portland protests. So I think that the political climate was getting really intense. And um, the musician, Daryl Grant, who is a, a, a Black jazz musician, um, composer, um, wanted to create um, a music video for his song to kind of highlight our, our youth, like, uh, and particularly youth of color, but how, how it is important to um, how, how young people are going to be the future, and that um, it was he wanted an image to um, highlight black excellence or um, or just excellence in our youth. Um, and he does a lot of work in the community. I think he's collaborated with um, Bravo Youth Orchestra. And um, I, um, I, I got a lot of the photo reference that I got was from Bravo Youth Orchestra. So at the time, this um we were collaborating with Seth who was the director at the time I, I believe that the new director his name is Al Alfonso but um I got access to their photo archive and was trying to figure out what sketch I would use to um create a mural for um for for this mural um and and this was just on a whim at the time ever all the um all the all the um, windows were boarded up and um, a lot of it was just asking for permission to paint because um, there was a lot of destruction in downtown at the time. So different groups were using the opportunity to be able to create public art on the boarded up windows. And at the time I knew a manager at this AC hotel at uh, the Marriott and uh, we were able to use this large, I think it was like 12 feet tall, maybe even taller, maybe it was 15 feet, 15 feet by 12 feet, I think, something like that. And we were able to get permission to paint there. Um, and I, again, I created this little mock-up. Uh, I just did a little photo collage um, on my iPad and then created this um, context. So um, I was getting better at, um, creating line work and creating a process where other people could paint. I had a system where I had cups with different colors and I just left the brushes in the cup and then they could just use one color at a time and fill them in. Uh, Daryl um, reached out to different families to come and paint in the middle of downtown. And I think it really brought a good energy to a space with a lot of um, aggression at the time and and it was a very nice collaborative energy and uh in in a during a time i mean even while we were painting i think people were still um protesting around us i i believe that that was happening and um but i think that there was a a good positive energy and um a, a good creativity that was happening uh um and i think that some of the families had come from the Bravo Youth Orchestra. Seth had brought some folks to come and paint. And then um, this is me and Daryl. Um, we took a picture together and he had a film crew that came um, and they were um, filming the process of creating the mural for their music video. And these are some of the still shots 
that we um, that were in the music video itself. The music video is seven minutes long, and I don't think that I'm going to play that. But I I do have this preview that um, Daryl that um, that the filmmaker made. I, I I apologize. I don't remember the filmmaker's name, but um, this is the this is the preview video that he created. <laughs> So that was the um, that was the Daryl Grant mural collaboration, and um, I was really um, I was really proud of being able to um, collaborate with Daryl at the time, and I do think it was something where I was trying to figure out how I could use my creative energy to um, kind of to to. To be a part of the conversation, and I do think that this was a, a, a big honor to be able to be a part of that uh, music video process. So um, the next project, so I, I I think I guess I have to go through all the slides. Um, we <laughs> this is uh, okay. So I still have like twenty minutes left. So I think I have two more projects left, and then um, I I'll. And then I think we're going to open it up for questions. But let me, so the next mural that I did. So um, during this time, um, there's a there's a organization called MISO. It's the Micro Entrepreneurial Services of Oregon. And they, um, they allow for, to, they make a, the process for young entrepreneurs a little bit easier. They, they help you set up, uh, they, they hook you up with a, a lawyer and they teach you how to they 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 have a business um, class that they teach and they teach you how to set up your own llc and how to deal with contracts and things like that so <laughs> and they also have a lot of resources for community grants so i think miso is a great organization but they also have a history of supporting um entrepreneurs of color um and especially in this neighborhood. This is located on MLK and Shaver, I believe, Northeast. And um, this is actually a, a place with um, several historic murals. Um, right opposite of this mural that we painted um, was uh, Isaka Shamsuddin's mural called Now is the Time, The Time is Now. And uh, the Isaka, I think, led a mural on this side as well. But because of issues with the building, the, the mural had to be painted over. I think the wall may have had to be rebuilt or restructured somehow. Um, and for a long time, this was a blank wall that was being hit with graffiti. Um, so I was not originally a part of this project, but I was working with an artist, Rodolfo, uh, Rodolfo Serna Redstone. And he um, he's a native artist, but he was reached out to by the Oregon Art Commission to help organize uh, a mural for MISO. And uh, this was part, this is a Zoom call as part of the planning committee. So I worked with, um, this was meant to be a mural for the um, Black community in specific. Um, the process was headed out on by a woman named Felicia. And there was also a historian that helped us um, guide our content. And then there was a woman from the Oregon Art Commission. And there was four, there was four other black, young black artists that were emerging and um, hadn't had a lot of experience doing murals. 
And I believe that Rodolfo, he brought me onto the project as someone that could help to facilitate the mural or to uh, co um, kind of uh, be on the project to guide the younger artists, but also to help to paint part of it as an artist. Um, we, we got a lot of historical reference from the Black community. And I also got a list of um, Black entrepreneurs who um, started um, their business through MISO. Um, so we, 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 we covered the, the Hadleys who started the first um, bakery. They were, it was the first Black owned bakery in Milwaukee. Um, also Dean's Barbershop and Salon. There's two images from that. Um, the historic um, Albina buildings. And then this woman, I think her name is Nini May. And she, Nina May. And she was a, a worker during uh, in the shipyards during Vanport. And then there was, um, uh, I forget his name, but he opened up a food cart pod in Northeast Portland. So um, this is a picture from his grand opening. And uh, we we worked together as a team, and this was a very large scale mural. It wasn't. Um, it it was. It, I think it was seventeen. I want to say it's like seventeen feet tall, and uh, we used an industrial scaffolding, and we had to work around this crazy steel um, planter. And it was a lot of folks' first mural, and um, it was exciting to work with these artists. Um, it was Latoya. Um, Latoya Lovely, Kyra, um, and uh, Adia Gibbs, and Manny, uh, and we work together. Um, and I, it's really cool to see how their artistic careers have progressed. And we've all done more murals, and I, I was just really thankful to be a part of this process and to meet other artists. Um, and also, um, I feel like there was a great response to this mural and something that was really celebrated. They they had people come to, <laughs> come together. People represented the fam uh, Hadley family in their bakery. People from the Dean's Barbershop came. Um, I, I want to remember this guy's, oh, I think it might, Jimmy Jimmy Wilson is the, is the man who started the food cart, but this is him um, um, now currently. Um, I believe that the food cart was uh, that might have been ten years ago or something. So this is this is the 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 um, Jimmy and his nephew, and then this is what they currently look like. So his nephew is much bigger now, but I was able to document that, and then the whole community came out, and I feel like it was very well received, and um, I was glad to have been able to help be a part of that process. And then I have one more. Um, mural that I want to, I, I feel like um, 2020 was a lot about um, about representing um, or at least um, giving a voice to the Black community. So I did a lot of these projects last year, but they were also very community involved and something I was very grateful to be able to do. Um, there is a wall in Old Town Chinatown right next to the CB, CB, CBA, CBC, the <laughs> CBCA, C, anyway. CCBA, right? CCBA, yes. Um, in, in downtown Chinatown, right next to their headquarters, there was these empty walls. And this, this building in particular had been vacated. And they were getting artists to paint murals on the side of the building before it gets demolished. I believe they're in the process of selling off the building. But there was a big wall. And uh, they were looking for an artist. And at the time, um, I was trying to um, collaborate with a woman, Lena Lewis, who is in charge of a creative um, organization called Viva La Free. And she had reached out to me a lot about trying to find a wall for some form of Black Lives Matter mural. And um, I had gone through a lot of iterations of reaching out to folks. And I know that I had access to boarded up buildings from the Dale Grant project. And uh, I reached out to Apano to see if, cause they had reached out to me about possibly doing some window 
decorations um, while the building was shut down during the pandemic. Um, and I think that they had boarded up windows as well. But I reached out to them. And um, as the project went on, it actually became a really big project to manage. And I didn't realize it, but I just went with it one step at a time. So I reached out to, <coughs> excuse me, I reached out to CACA and uh, uh, hooked up with Helen Ying, and she's in charge of this conference, this Asian American Youth Leadership Conference. I think it's called the AAYLC, uh, Asian American Youth Leadership Conference, and that's an organization that that um, provides um, Asian American programming and resources to kids all over Portland in all all the different regions of Portland and schools. I think it's a club. Um, in all of the Portland schools um, for Asian Americans and people of Asian American backgrounds. And we wanted to build awareness and understanding of the importance of understanding solidarity with the Black community. And we wanted to create a mural that addressed those issues um, and, and to create context for discussion about what solidarity means. So um, this is the content portion of it we got folks to come out um, um people in activist groups and people of different creative backgrounds but also youth um and and leaders in the aayLC to come together and have a discussion about asian and black solidarity so that was the premise of the conversation and um lena led some of the discussion Amea Okamoto, who's a, a really young activist and artist, um, led some of that discussion as well, and I facilitated that. And people were able to tell their story and bring up issues of colorism in the Asian community, how um, brown and dark skinned folks um, have, there's there's just more difficulty in colorism in our, in even within the Asian community and we brought up that issue and also the idea that um there's has been a lot of issues and conflict between the black and asian community in in the country's history and how it's important to be able to realize that we're we're all going through the same struggles together and we were able to have some of those discussions um lena and i brought together this team of artists um who are um who have a, a background in art and are pursuing art to kind of um, create our own artwork. So after we had that discussion, each artist created their own sketches to be able to address the discussion that we had and some of the issues that we brought up. The, so the team was Justin Phillips, myself, my wife, Amisa, Amea, uh, Kiana, and Lena. And um, we each created our own <laughs> individual individual sketches for this project. And I was tasked with taking everybody's sketches and, and creating a design for a mural. So I took everybody's black and white sketches and then um, we knew that they wanted a colorful mural. So um, I, I created the composition for that, some of the color blocks. And there was this quote that was um, created by our, our friend, it was an activist, um, um, um and 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 use the quote we are here as immigrants because black freedom fighters of the civil rights movement fought for us to exist in this land and i felt like that was a quote so i'll read it again we are here as immigrants because black freedom fighters in the civil rights movement fought for us to exist in this land so i felt like this was a a, a strong message that i wanted to communicate in the mural um and we were able to um, include that and um, create a community mural out of that. Um, this, so this is again, it's the the collaboration process that I refined. Uh, this time, I I did all the outline in chalk. And uh, if anyone's interested in doing collaborative murals, people are kind of scared to paint to the <laughs> to the edge of things. So what I learned is that if you use a thinner line, they have to paint to the edge. If you kind of have thick paint, 
and it's a little hard to paint to the edge, but this worked out really, really well, where I used chalk to do the outlines, and then I did these color swatches, and people just came in and were able to match the color of what they needed to paint, and then fill in within the boundaries like a coloring book. And it's the same process that I've been using, but I've refined it a bit. And this was really successful. And I think part of it is because there was like older participants. Uh, the members of AAYLC are um, older high school kids. And they and also a lot of community leaders came out and were able to um, fill this in. And, and part of the creative process for me was putting in more patterns in the background and making it a more intricate design. So we spent one day filling in the flat colors and some of the artists were there and were able to refine some of their pieces. But then once we had all the colors filled in um, as a as a community activity, then um, the artists who created their artwork were able to finalize their work and then make it uh, make it um, their own and kind of um, have their own style artwork on the wall. And then this was the the final mural that we created and something that. Um, I think it's still there, um, but um, that was a way that we commemorated that time period in Portland. Um, I did, th this is it, This I. that's all that I came up with. I feel like an hour is a lot of time for me to fill. Um, I might have to end a little bit early and go into um, questions and answers. So I'm gonna exit out of the share screen right now and then see, Oh yeah, that's yes. that's absolutely perfect, and yeah, and and I think they're going to be lots of sort of. It was more a way to spur a conversation, so yeah, this is this is great. Thank you for that wonderful sort of presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions, but I, I I will also wait and see if if um, there are questions on the chat. But and anybody watching, feel free to sort of post them um, and. A couple of you are backstage do join. Um, but um, you've done a lot of this this collaborative um, neural creation, and there have been just these really powerful, um, visually compelling, but also in terms of the stories and how the collaboration. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us, like, how what, what are the relationships that are built out of this, but for you, but also between other sort of communities or artists? Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about sort of the side effects of all of this work, yeah. Well, what's interesting to me is that <laughs> as an artist, much of my training has just been to figure out techniques and composition mm -hmm. and figure out how to just paint competently. But it seems like during this process over the last five years, I've taken on a lot of different hats. So I think that I've become a, an events organizer, I've become somewhat of a historian or a, and also kind of like a journalist. And um, I feel like that's become part of my role, but also something that I've become a little bit more passionate about is understanding the city that I live in. So I have a, 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 little, a better understanding of the histories of the different communities in the area. And I've also, I feel like been able to establish um, a lot of relationships with other people who are doing similar cultural work and exploring issues of identity. And um, what I've learned about that is I've never taken a chance to understand myself. So as an Asian American, I've always just thought, oh, I don't have my own story or my story is not worth telling. And what I'm learning is that everyone that I interview sort of feels the same way that there's a form of like oh i'm not significant like you're actually going to interview me you're going to paint me and um it's like yeah like it makes sense to me that i would do that and what it's taught me to do is telling other people's stories has helped me figure out how to tell my own life story and what's important to other people is it's um i realize it's important to me and that everyone has their own story if if you and if you learn to tell it, then you'll meet other people who are in similar situations as you or have the same issues as you, and then that dialogue can begin. So I think that for me, it's it's allowed me to really develop an idea of community and what that means. But it's also given, and, and I started therapy 
like personal therapy maybe like in during the pandemic maybe like two years ago or something and it, it's really put me in a space where I think it's important to understand myself and why I I am the way that I am so I think that it's it's allowed me to really um, do a lot of self exploration this this work and um, also it 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 makes me feel like I'm not alone in what I go through and 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 doing community work has it's interesting because there's an artist who once said like uh, there's this artist David Cho and he said that if I paint something, people will give it to me. So I paint a drum set and someone will give me a drum set. Or I paint these things and people will give give something to me in return. That's like what I'm painting. And for me, it's like to paint community in an odd way. It's given me community or put me in the community. So I think that that's a very, and I, I, I value relationships and I value not not feeling alone. And, and I think that part of me is that I, I have forms of imposter syndrome and and i moved here 10 years ago so i've been here for a good amount of time but i view myself as like i i, I have a fear that i'm not welcome here you know, part part of it is because i'm asian part of it is because i'm from california and i'm just not from around here i haven't been here very long uh and um i think that doing these projects have made me feel embraced and welcomed in the city so that's that's been important to me yeah, and there are lots of comments of in the chat of people who are so excited about your presentation and really appreciate your your sharing of your work and the story of how you how you came to do this sort of work. Um, you talked a lot about the collaborative part of the um, the process and the creation, the physical creations of the murals, um, but you also have a background as an illustrator and. Um, I think there was a question about what are the digital tools you use? It's clear there's a there's a significant design editing digital tool component of this. And do you want to unpack that a little bit? Um, what what software, what tools, what what process there? Yeah, I I would say um, that being able to have access to the technology that we have. <laughs> is the only way that I could do what I do, especially with murals. Um, part of it is just having Google and just having the internet and being able to do your own research. Also, part of social media, everybody's created their own story, at least like their own context for how they want to be seen. So when I'm researching people, it's much easier to be able to learn about people nowadays with social media and to be able to Google Google things, but also I realized that there is an importance to digital archiving and then creating and, and being able to preserve things with high resolution. So everything loses resolution over time and internet resolution has been terrible. But um, part of my recreation is to be able to like create something that's sharp and refine something that probably originally was very pixelated. So I'll, I'll paint something that's like 50 feet tall or I'm not 50 feet tall, sorry, like 10 feet tall and off of like a little image that's like 500 pixels by 300 pixels. But I, I can be able to do that with the skills that I have. But um, some of the tools that are really great are the iPad and other photo editing software. You can do mock-ups really easy. So you take pictures of the wall and you can put your artwork on top of it to make it look like the mural's already there. And that helps you sell your mural to the client and then just give them a good idea of what things look like. There's also a form of um it, it's gridding so um there's a process of gridding that people do where they put a grid on their sketch and put a grid on the wall and that way you can tell the proportions of how big you're supposed to make something there's something called a doodle grid or um a, like a lazy grid and what you do is you use the textures of the wall or you can draw little patterns or designs on the wall um first and then you take a picture of it and then when you superimpose a picture on top of it that's transparent you can actually um, tell where the picture is supposed to go so if you do the alphabet like a b c d e f g on the wall and then you um and then you put your picture on top of it you can if it's a face